All right, all right. Well, please continue to enjoy your time of eating and fellowship. But we're going to transition on now to our time of disciple makers. Can you all hear me okay? Do I need to adjust this some? All right. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Whoop, whoop. Well, um, as you know, this morning Bill continued his series on the creation account and was discussing Genesis chapter 1 and the creation of light and its relationship to the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars. And so today at Disciple Makers, we're going to kind of unpack some more of the significance of these luminaries of the sun, the moon, and the stars and their purpose in creation. So, start off with a question. What, was the, what is the Hebrew word for light in Genesis 1-3? In the back? Was it or? Or? Yes, or. All right, so pronounce or. So, it's pretty, pretty easy to remember. Now, to get a little bit tricky on you, what was the Hebrew word for light in verse 14? I thought I heard it over there. Mayor? Yes. Mayor. Which way am I? Oh, there we go. All right. So, great. At least we had some people paying attention, Bill. It's good. Yeah. Oh, 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 no. All right. For those of you who didn't catch that, what does mayor mean? Essence of light. Essence of light, and I heard one, light bearers, yes. So it is used uh, in the creation account for the sun, moon, and stars, as well as lights on candlesticks and lamps throughout uh, the rest of the Old Testament. So, what were the purposes for these lights, for these light bearers? Does anybody remember the, the big three? Get... I'm hearing some mumbling, but be bold. Signs, yes, that was one. Seasons, yes. And one more. Illumination, yes. So we had illumination, seasons, and signs. So we know that God created everything for a purpose, and including or included in that in all of creation, even the sun, moon, and stars had a purpose. Illumination, signs, and seasons. We learned today that the sun, sorry, this clicker is fighting me. The sun sustains life through the light that it shines on, birth, on earth, both directly and directly, being the reflection through the moon. And we, we learn kind of a little bit about what would happen if the sun was not exactly where God placed it. God created everything and set everything in order. He set the foundations in place so that we could have life. But let's take a look at what exactly would happen if it, things were off by just a fraction of us being closer or further away from the sun. Oh, did I skip it? Should automatically start. How lucky we are that Earth's orbit is stable and benign. But it's a delicate balance. The smallest change could kill us all. If Earth's orbit were closer to the sun, we would be like our closest neighbor, Venus. 
Venus is a pretty good example of what might happen to the Earth if our orbit shifted a little bit in from where we are now. Venus has this hugely thick atmosphere that traps all of the heat, and the surface is close to 900 degrees. If we moved even just a little bit closer to the Sun, we would become more like Venus. Oceans would boil away. Our planet would become a desert. Life would be destroyed. A small shift in the opposite direction, and instead of boiling, we'd freeze. You would have snowball Earth. The Earth completely encased in ice. And that's only by moving the Earth a fraction of its distance from the sun. The polar ice caps would expand. Oceans would freeze. A permanent ice age would begin. The smallest shift in Earth's orbit, and we die by fire or ice. So, what would happen if God had not created the sun and the Earth and the relationship that they're in? It's pretty obvious. We'd be dead. We would never would have had a beginning, really. And that's, I mean, just taking a minute and processing that, it is amazing how much, you know, the, you know, the secular world, the world that is in darkness, that has rejected truth, they buy in, you know, buy into the evolutionary theory that it just happened that we are in the perfect alignment in relationship with the sun to where it sustains life. I mean, it takes, to me, it takes more faith, false faith, to trust in that happenstance than it does in seeing, okay, here we have the reliability of knowing that the sun rises and sets. We know that we're orbiting the sun to where we're not going to burn up we're not going to freeze to death because God set it in place. So we also know that the moon reflects the sun's light during the darkness of night. But there's, there's also another significant aspect of the moon in the creation account and why, you know, in God's infinite wisdom, he created the moon to orbit the Earth in just the right manner. And this, this video clip here kind of explains. I know some of these videos, we've got a lot of smart people here, especially, well, not just especially, but including our homeschool families. Um, I say that because I'm a product of pu the public school system. Don't hold it against me too much. Um, so. This video here, some of these videos, they're going to explain the, the kind of scientific, the scientific significance of why it's so awesome that God created the, the universe the way he did, why he created the sun, the moon, and the stars in relation to our earth the way he did to, to bless us, to, to bless creation so that we could in turn glorify him. So this, this video clip talks about the significance of the moon. And actually, before we get into that, I'll just ask, does anybody, can anybody give an answer of what would happen if we did not have the moon the way that God designed it? Some ideas? Tides? Yeah. We'd either have no tides or they would be out of flux. Any, any others? All right, well. Yes, absolute darkness at night. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe we can learn a little bit from the videos then. So. Right, I'm going to rely on the back because I think last time I skipped it. Can you guys queue up the next one? It should autoplay. <laughs> Oh, hey there, Brain Stuff. I'm Lauren, and it's time we had a talk about the moon. If it wasn't there, things would be a lot different here on our little blue planet. First, we'd see some pretty drastic changes to the ocean. 
The moon is responsible for most of the effects of the tides. Without it, tides would only be a third of the size that they are now. This is because the sun would account for the major gravitational pull affecting the altitude of the ocean. And while the sun is bigger than the moon, like, you know, 400 times bigger, it is also much further away. So the tides it creates only have about 40% of the strength of our current lunar tides. Surfing wouldn't be the only thing that suffered. Lots of ecosystems rely on the motion and changes of the tides. Plus, the moon holds a bulge of tidal water around Earth's middle that would disperse without its gravity, changing coastlines around the world. Did you know that the moon helps slow down the rotation of Earth? Without it, we wouldn't have 24-hour days that'd be more like six to eight hours long. We'd have to remake our calendar to accommodate between 1,100 and 1,400 days per year. Not only would that screw up all of our schedules, but a faster rotation would also increase the amount of wind and storms on our planet. If that's not enough extreme climate change for you, no moon would also destabilize the Earth's axis, changing our tilt with side effects that would render the planet inhospitable to lots of its creatures. Right now we're tilted at a lovely 23 degrees, which gives us relatively mild seasons and environments. But the moon acts as an external force that stabilizes that angle. But without it, we could wobble anywhere between zero degrees with no seasons and barely any sunlight to 85 degrees, where the planet would fall over on its side like a kitten on a catnip high. Mars, for example, wobbles between only 15 and 35 degrees, and it experiences drastic climate changes where ice drifts all the way from the poles to the equator. Finally, gang, I don't know if you've noticed, but the moon's pretty darn bright up there in the middle of the night. Uh, sure, the sun is 400,000 times brighter, but sometimes it still hits your eye like, well, you know. Which means that without it, our nights would be a lot darker than we're used to. You try stumbling around in the woods without a moon and see how you like it. Now that you know the major ways not having moon would affect us, it kind of gives a new meaning to the children's story, Goodnight Moon, doesn't it? All right, so we see that there's, there's a lot at stake for the moon to be placed, for God to have placed the moon in its relationship with the sun and our earth. Again, could not have been happenstance, could not have been chance. This is a creator who had a purpose a purpose for the moon, more than just wanting to eat it because it looks like cheese. So we also talked about some of the ways where those of, those of the world, even those of us before we were brought into the light, uh, were brought into the faith, have taken the blessing of illumination and skewed it, have twisted it and illumination gone wrong. So we saw that throughout the history of mankind, including, uh, including the people of the Israelites, the Israelite people failed at worshiping God, the Creator, and instead turned to worship the sun and the moon and the stars. You know, we, for many of us who have studied some ancient uh, civilizations and are familiar with uh, ancient religions, we know that just about every single one of them had some sort of sun and moon god or goddess. So here's just a short list to give some examples. We learned that with uh, the Egyptians, it was Ra or Amun-Ra for sun. Ah, there we go. All right. So, yeah, we've got you know, Apollo or Helios for the Greeks, Ra, Amun Ra for Egyptian, Mithras for Persian, Utu for Mesopotamian. I'm um, not going to try to pronounce some of those others. Uh, but there's just a few to give you an example uh, that throughout history, those who are wandering in darkness turn instead of to the Creator, they turn to the created in worship. And here are a list of some moons. We talked about how they're not as significant, but still often have a deity attached to them because, again, recognizing the awesomeness of this aspect of creation, but because of not having faith in God, not turning to God, in error, man has turned to worship the created. 
So, and we kind of talked about, well, we don't really know, you know, that doesn't really happen a lot these days, you know, there's not very many people that are going around uh, worshiping the sun and the moon, but for those of you who don't know, I uh, am in the Navy, I was a Navy chaplain's assistant for five and a half years before being commissioned as a chaplain candidate, which is what I am now, and uh, working towards returning to active duty as a chaplain. While I was a chaplain's assistant, one of the responsibilities for me was to go through our unit and find out the uh, religious makeup, find out what all uh, faith traditions were represented by our unit. And surprisingly, a growing number is paganism. People here and, and today are actually returning to worshiping the created being, the creation rather than the creator. They're, we're actually seeing a resurgence, if you will, of paganism, people worshiping the sun and the moon and the stars and creation again. It's, you know, on one hand, we think, that's crazy. They should know better. We're, we, you know, we're in the we're in the modern time, we, we know better. But again, when you reject the light, when you reject the gospel, when you reject truth, you're wandering in darkness and you're going to wind up worshiping something. And if it's not the creator, it's going to be something else. All right. So next thing we learn, one of the purposes for these light bearers are to give us seasons. We know that the rotation of the earth around the sun gives us different seasons and our calendar year. Well, here's a little video that kind of talks about that some more. The earth has seasons because its axis of rotation is tilted a property it shares in common with some other planets in the solar system. It's tilted by an angle of 23.5 degrees to a line perpendicular to its orbital plane, shown here in green. Incidentally, the Earth shares this orbital plane with all the other planets in the solar system. From Earth, we see this plane as an imaginary line that all the planets in the Sun seem to follow through the sky. We call this line the ecliptic. Here, we see the Earth on the 22nd of September, the autumn equinox, when the northern part of its axis is not pointing towards or away from the Sun and day and night are exactly the same length. Next is the winter solstice, when the northern hemisphere is pointing away from the sun. Following on is the spring equinox, when day and night are equal lengths again. Then we move to the summer solstice, the longest day in the northern hemisphere and the shortest in the southern hemisphere. And finally, we're back to the autumn equinox again. The word equinox comes from the Latin words for equal and night, equinox. The final part of the story is that the Earth's orbit is not perfectly circular. In fact, the Earth's orbit is rather eccentric and elliptical, and during the northern summer, the Earth is furthest away from the Sun at 152 million kilometers, as opposed to 147 million kilometers during the winter, when it's closest to the Sun. So you can see that the Earth's axis is tilted in the same direction all year round. The seasons are caused by the Sun's energy hitting the northern or southern hemisphere more directly as it orbits the Sun on its tilted axis. So that's what causes the seasons. Right, so, sorry, hopefully that video didn't give anybody motion sickness, especially after eating. Um, but yeah, so, again, God established the foundations of creation. We see in the, the thing that was neat to me in that video is I often hear, oh, well, you know, it's, it's just about an even uh, circle, our rotation around the sun. But that's not exactly true. It's offset just a little bit. It's just a little bit of obtuse uh, oval shape to where we have 
the seasons the way that we have them. And kind of, as Bill mentioned earlier, how awesome is it that we have seasons and that we're not stuck in one particular season, except for the few locations around the world where there's not a whole lot of, of change. Um, I love the change of the seasons. Uh, I spent three years in 29 Palms, Southern California. It was a grueling time uh, having, or being someone who loves seasons, it was just hot desert all the time. So if we were stuck like that all the time for the entire uh, existence, uh, I mean, maybe some of you would enjoy that. You're like, yeah, I love hot weather. Me, not so much. I like the seasons. And flip side of that, being stuck in the cold all year round, maybe that uh, makes more of you kind of shudder at the thought. Uh, so we talked about the seasons being brought about because of the relationship of the earth with the sun, but there's also some significant seasons that come about from the rotation of the moon around the earth. Okay, so we know that we get the lunar calendar from that, the, you know, the changing of the new moon, we see uh, throughout the Old Testament that this marked the, a lot of the Jewish festivals. In fact, last year, I don't know how many of you remember, but as we were going through uh, the book of John, we discussed the significance of the, the lunar calendar and its influence on the Jewish festivals and how that pointed towards Christ and that Christ was the fulfillment of all of these promises through the uh, Jewish festivals. And again, we kind of talked about it a little bit in the previous uh, video, but again, the rotation of the moon around the earth affects the tides. Ha who all here enjoys fishing? All right. Ha how many of you have done shore fishing? Not, not a few, a few. As I grew up in Florida, in Pensacola, Florida, we had the beach. And one of my favorite things to do was shore fishing. We'd have our big old poles, and we'd, we'd wait for the, for the tide to, uh, to change so that we could wade out to the sandbar as far as we could and cast our lines, and then we'd wade back in and sit there hoping that either a big redfish or a shark would, would uh, go after our bait. Now I think about it and I'm like, ah, the waiting out there in shark infested waters is maybe not so good of an idea. So we, we kayak our lines out there now. But all that to say is the changing of the tides impact uh, the life of the sea and also impact our lives. And so this little video clip kind of expounds that a little more on how the rotation of the moon and its relationship with the sun and the earth affect our tides. Whoop. Oh, I'm taking my hands off. Hey there, I'm Josh Clark, and in this Brain Stuff, I explain to you how the tides work. Have you ever seen somebody buried up to their neck in sand on the beach, and then the tide slowly comes in and they drown, and wondered, I wonder how tides work? Well, next time, you'll know, and you can explain it to that person as they wait to die. There's a lot of factors involved in creating the tides here on Earth, but the big three are the moon, the sun, and the Earth. The gravitational pull of all three of those bodies interacting creates the tides. The biggest factor, actually, is the moon. It exerts about 2.2 times more power on the tides than the sun does. So for once, the moon gets to one-up the sun kind of a big deal to it. Imagine for our purposes the earth is right here and the moon is directly above it. Now they exert a gravitational pull on one another and since uh, on the earth most things are pinned down, we have shoes, uh, buildings have foundations, stuff stays in place. But the oceans, being literally fluid, actually can be pulled toward the moon and this is what creates the tide. The moon's here, it's pulling on the ocean at the top of the earth, creating a high tide on the top. And on the bottom, another high tide is created because the earth itself is pulled toward the moon, even though the oceans down here have less gravitational pull exerted on them, being farthest away from the moon. So on the top and bottom, you have high tide, 
because of the tidal bulges, and on the sides that are at right angles to the moon, you have low tide because the oceans stretch thin over the surface of the Earth. Pretty crazy, huh? So, like I said, the sun also exerts an influence on the tides, but it's less pronounced than the moon's. See, it actually enhances or diminishes the gravitational pull of the moon here on Earth. When the sun and the moon are in alignment, the sun enhances the moon's gravitational pull creating higher tides than normal. They're called spring tides, and they happen on a full moon or a new moon. Now when the sun and the moon are at right angles to one another, with the Earth right about here, the sun diminishes the gravitational pull of the moon on Earth, creating lower than normal high tides, also called neap tides. These happen on the quarter moons. Because the Earth and the moon are constantly moving and moving around one another, uh, there's a constant movement from high tide to low tide. Twice a day, you get a high tide in most places, usually once every 12 hours and 25 minutes. But this can vary, and some places only see a high tide once every 24 hours. Those are called diurnal tides. So this is a daily occurrence, actually twice daily in most places. So again, we see the significance of God being purposeful in creating the sun and the moon and our earth in a relationship with each other to sustain life, and not just to sustain life, but to make life enjoyable, to, uh, you know, to get to enjoy fishing and a lot of other more important things. So what is, what is the next thing uh, after signs, or, oh, sorry, I gave it away. Man, after seasons, uh, signs. So the first thing that Bill talked about is signs, first of all, signs are not in and of themselves, but they point to something. And so the first sign that we discussed is the sun and the moon and the stars are a sign of God's covenant faithfulness with us. You know, it, it, again, this did not just happen by random chance. It is clear, just because of the implications of a sh minor shift in any of these aspects of creation, that life would not be sustainable. So, the sun and the moon and the stars is a reminder that God was purposeful in setting the foundations of the earth to make life possible for us and the rest of creation so that we could, in turn, give glory and honor to Him as it is due. And again, it also is a reminder that for those of us who are living in light, who are uh, trusting in God and believe that there was a purpose and that there was a created order, we don't have to live in fear of, oh man, you know, like Bill said this morning, we don't have to live in fear of an asteroid colliding and, you know, into the sun and causing it to explode and wiping out the entire solar system. We know that God set things in motion with a purpose to sustain life until, until Christ comes back and there's no need for sun and moon and stars. So the next thing that we talked about for signs is has a lot to do with the sun and the moon, but then also to do with the stars. And we kind of talked about, you know, a little bit how we kind of skirt the stars away from significance. But they do have a huge significance, especially if you uh, are nautical. Do we have any sailors in here? It doesn't have to be, you know, in the U.S. Navy. It can be casual sailing. Any? Any? None? No? Oh. Oh, got a kind of a little hand, maybe some interest. Do what? Okay, shipyard. There we go. I had a boat in my bathtub. You got a boat in your bathtub? Okay. All right. Well, you may not have learned celestial navigation for the boat in your bathtub, <laughs> but. If you wanted to take that little boat out of the bathtub and into the sea, you'd probably lose it. But um, 
the, one of the neat things about the stars being placed where they are, God putting the stars and the planets throughout the solar system, throughout the universe, where he did, is it became a map for us, a map to navigate traveling the earth at nighttime. And uh, so, me being in the Navy, uh, definitely draw my, or drew my curiosity, and uh, I wish that I could say that I knew how to uh, celestially navigate, but that wasn't a huge part of my training. Uh, however, I'm still curious about it. And let's see, got a little bit, a little video. Nowadays, we have GPS. We rely on that sort of technology, the ability to take a phone or a piece of electronics out, tap a couple of buttons, and within a few seconds to know exactly where you are. That technology is actually rooted and based in some of the techniques of old. Sailors would actually triangulate their position hundreds of years ago by measuring three objects in the sky. One of the more well-known instruments for navigation is what is called the sextant. For example, a sextant could measure the position of the noon sun, how high it is above the horizon. That measurement, along with some other calculations, could give you your latitude. Navigating during the day is able to be done using the sun, but at night we're relying on other objects, like the North Star, Polaris, for example. Measuring the angle of the North Star above the horizon is your latitude. Other instruments that we find that were helpful in navigation, one of the more well-known ones, was the chronometer. Chronometer, an accurate timepiece that could keep time out at sea. The Nautical Instrument Shop is a fantastic place to learn about the tools. And if you really wanted to get the full navigation picture, I would recommend going aboard some of our vessels. You can see the places on those vessels where navigation happens. Many people today consider celestial navigation to be a backup plan, um, but it could be a life-saving backup plan. If you're going to go out into the middle of the ocean, it'd really be a good idea for you to know what to do if that little screen all of a sudden just goes blank on you. All right. So again, as, as he kind of alluded to, a lot of people now, even sailors, kind of look at celestial navigation as a backup plan. And in fact, in 2000, the US Navy began phasing out celestial navigation because we're like, oh, we got computers now. We don't need that. It's so much work. It requires you know, learning all the you know, math and uh, working out how it coordinates with the maps and charts and everything. It was so much easier to do it computer-based. However, in 2011, the Navy realized, oh, well, with the increasing threat in cyber warfare and electronic warfare, we should probably make sure that our sailors are prepared to navigate ships if there's anything that happens that knocks out the electronic system. So they began, they began phasing it back in and uh, requiring it by uh, navigators and assistant navigators and in fact there was a new policy that was put out to where beginning next year they're going to be requiring enlisted quartermasters who help out with the helm of the ship and some ROTC pilots, um, Navy pilots, are going to be requiring celestial navigation in case they are stuck at sea without their GPS or if their battery dies. So. So that's just, again, something neat that God put the stars in place to where they could be a map for us to enjoy another aspect of his creation so that we could in turn turn to him and thank him for just his sovereignty and his, his delight in us. So we kind of, we talked about how some of this stuff can go can become skewed when our focus is not on the creator, but rather on the created. And so we also uh, discussed this morning in how that happens even when it comes to signs related to the sun, moon, and the stars. And let's see. 
All right. Sign's gone wrong. Who remembers the big example from this morning? Astrology. Astrology. Yes. Good, good guess. Good guess. He said he guessed. Hopefully he was paying attention and it just came back from memory. Um, okay. Who here can list the zodiac signs? I would say good. You know, maybe, maybe you're like, I do, but I don't want to admit it. That's okay. If, if you do, it could have been, you know, from time in the past. It could be just the influence of culture. I know a lot of them just because I would hear people say, oh, I am a Pisces. I'm this, that, and the other. I, I found out that I was a Leo, that I am a Leo, not because I looked it up, but because people were like, oh, when's your birthday? And I'd tell them, and they're like, oh, you're a Leo. I'm like, oh, okay. What, what does that mean? And then they'd, some would say, oh, yeah, you, you live just like a Leo. You're a predictable Leo. And then others would say, you are not like any other Leo that I've met. So what I learned in all that is, uh, well, I knew that beforehand, but it was just a reaffirmation of how silly it is. But the reality is a lot of people, sadly, look to horoscopes and all of this. I mean, the reason why they're still printed and they're still popular is because People look at them. People rely on the information that is being spewed at them through this um, to define and shape their lives. And it's, it's really sad because, you know, again, they should be looking at the Creator, uh, but they are stumbling in darkness and they are looking at the created for their hope and their future rather than the Creator, rather than our Lord and Savior. So, let's see, returning back to proper signs. So, another thing we learned is there are signs for God's judgment. One of the big things that we learned is, is it was huge in sign of God's judgment during the ninth plague uh, for the people of Egypt. Um, in the time uh, leading up to the Exodus. You know, again, God darkened the lights to where completely pitch black. We kinda, uh, Pastor Bill talked about uh, how eerie it was for him to enter into a, a dark room uh, for photography. And I've heard that there are some... Some aspects, not to get too gruesome, but some aspects of torture in some instances is to put somebody in a dark box because it literally drives them crazy. They cannot handle being the deafening darkness. And so imagine, if you will, experiencing that for three days like the Egyptians did, receiving the judgment uh, from God for, for their sin and their idolatry. And so... You know, again, thankfully, we have the moon and we have the stars, so we're not walking in utter darkness. But you think about that and apply that spiritually, how, many, how much of the world is walking around in darkness? And yet we can be, should be, are called to be the light bearers to bring light to them. Uh, some other places where the uh, signs are in relationship to God's judgment or, sorry, the, uh, the sun, moon, and stars are signs in relation to God's judgment. Isaiah 13 we mentioned, uh, Ezekiel 32, again Matthew 24, and the book of Revelation. It uh, talks about it a lot there. So, the, oh, I jumped ahead. Sorry. So the, the last one that we'll, we wanted to remember is, is the sign of God's love. God's love and faithfulness to us. You know, again, we, we look at the covenant with Abraham and God saying, as your descendants will be as many as the, uh, the stars and the, the expanse of the heavens and the sands of the sea. Again, pointing to the awesomeness of the creation of the sun, moon, and the stars to exemplify the awesomeness of God's covenant with Abraham. And uh, again, we, we see that with uh, Joseph and his dreams 
um, that didn't particularly get him in uh, good graces with his brothers. They didn't really like it. Uh, but again, that was a sign to Joseph for what God had in store for him. And yes, it was a uh, difficult travel, but again, God used him for his purposes and his glory. And then we see the star leading the wise men to Jesus um, in the New Testament. And so time and time again, the sun, moon, and stars are also used to show us God's love and faithfulness to us. So uh, my encouragement to each and every one of you and myself as well is... To learn how to use a clicker. No. Uh, to let your light shine as a testimony to God's glory, just as the sun, the moon, and the stars do. If you have any questions. No? All right. Well, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you that... This is the day that you have made, and we are to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for our time to come together as a church family, as uh, your body, and coming together to worship you um, and enjoy this time of fellowship. Lord, may we be challenged to be light bearers, to see the, the sun and the moon and the stars and the purpose that you have for them and understand that you have an even greater purpose for us, Lord, that we are your light bearers to this dark world. Let us go forth and be a reflection of your truth and your love and your glory in this world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.